65 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you again, Lord Father, for your word. I pray you just give me unction, Lord Father, uh, to preach. Uh, God, you'd open our hearts tonight, Lord Father, and that you'd fill it with your sweet spirit, Lord Father. Take this word, and God, encourage the saints, Lord, reprove, rebuke, exhort, instruct in righteousness, Lord Father, whatever. Our hearts need tonight, Lord Father. There'll be one lost, Lord God. I pray tonight, uh, Lord Father, that you would just touch them, Lord Father. Our hearts be tender to your word, Lord, in the movement of the Spirit. So, God, I pray you just do something in the midst of your people. We just thank you and praise you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Enoch uh, is significant in many ways in the Bible. He's mentioned in a couple of other places in Scripture. Of course, Hebrews chapter 11 and the book of Jude. And so, uh, anytime you see... Uh, someone from the Old Testament mentioned in the New Testament, uh, that gives you um, a reason, even a more reason, uh, to kind of dig down into that, kind of drive uh, that home and what that means to us. And they're, they're in there and uh, mentioned for uh, some reasons that God wants you to know. And you have to do a little study sometimes to find out. So Enoch is significant in Scripture for several reasons that I want to look at this evening. Uh, first, certainly his faith. Uh, is certainly significant and an example for us in the time that we're living. Uh, Hebrews 11.5 says, By faith Enoch was translated. In other words, he was uh, raptured, uh, would be uh, what we would call it, that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him in him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Of course, his life is significant because through faith he was saved from the wrath to come. He was saved from the wrath of coming. That's significant for you and I. We'll talk about that in a minute. But he was saved from the flood and the destruction of the world. His life is significant because he was one of the two men uh, in the Bible along with a, a man named Elijah that cheated death. That cheated death. And they didn't die. They just uh, went up to heaven. And uh, that's, that, that is significant. And uh, we can talk about that a little bit. That's a sermon within itself. And it's also significant because uh, perhaps his... Uh, family, a little bit more famous than Enoch. He had a famous family. And so that's significant uh, as we look at that tonight. And so let's just uh, look uh, at uh, three points here tonight that Enoch is significant in and three uh, kind of things I believe will help us out in our Bible study. And so I'm going to preach to you tonight uh, first of all, and I want to look uh, at this first thing, Enoch and our future. Enoch and our future. Jude 14 through 15, verse 14 and 15 tells us this, And Enoch also, and this is speaking of this same Enoch in the book of Jude, also the seventh from Adam prophesied of this, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all 
and to convince all their ungod that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, this, the, it's significant. Whatever the Bible says is always significant. But you'll notice that he mentions specifically that he's the seventh from Adam. Now, we already talked about seven a little bit this morning. Uh, all the times, that's God's perfect number, so to speak. You see it in creation. Uh, you see it in a lot of things. Seven notes, musical notes. Uh, seven days in a week. But you see it in the Bible over and over again. Uh, throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, especially in the book of Revelation. But seven, again, means something. And of course, uh, what it means here is that Enoch was the culmination uh, of man and his faith in God. It's interesting that the same man uh, that was the seventh from Adam on Cain's side, you remember Cain? Remember what Cain did? He did what? Okay, some of you remember what he did. Say that again. He murdered his brother Abel, right? And so he was the wicked line uh, from Adam and Eve. And he was put out, he was a vagabond, he was cast out. And the seventh from him was a man named Lamech. He was a wicked man, an evil man. But the seventh on Seth's side, which was a godly side, was this man Enoch. And so this man uh, culminated as the seventh from Adam. And he is the really the epitome of faith uh, in a wicked, wicked time. And that's what, it, that's what that seventh is in there for, I believe, to, to draw attention to that. We also find out through these verses, uh, if we didn't have these New Testament verses, we wouldn't know, but we also find out that he was a preacher and a prophet. Now that's amazing. And the reason it's amazing is because they didn't have any Bible back then, okay? They had no Bible. They had no written word of the law. This is way before uh, Moses, way before the book of Exodus, and way before God gives the law to Moses. And so it's, it's really really amazing that he was a preacher really back in those di days and a prophet uh, and that's amazing within itself but because of his faith listen because of his faith because he was a uh, walker with God a servant of God he had great faith in God and because of his faith he knew the mind and the plan of the master you see in the Bible it's always the same it's those the servants they always had the mind of the master. Did you ever notice that in the Bible? Notice this, John 2, 9. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made with wine. Remember the first miracle in the Bible? That's amazing that uh, most people that don't go to church, they know that, don't they? They turn the water into wine. Everybody knows that verse. All the heathens know that verse, don't they? They'll throw that on you, you know, if you talk about alcohol or something like that. And, and so, uh, but anyway, back to this story. It says, And the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and he knew not whence it was. In other words, uh, Jesus saw that there was a problem. Uh, he took the water, turned it into wine. They didn't know about it. The master didn't know about it. The guest didn't know about it. But notice what it says in this parenthesis. I love the parenthesis uh, here in the Bible. It says, But the servants which drew the water knew. Nobody knew the water. They turned water into wine. Nobody knew the miracle except the servants. Servant knows the mind of his master. Mm -hmm. If you don't know the will of God in your life, then maybe it's because you're not serving God. Is what I'm trying to say to you. John 12, 26 says, If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father answer. Philippians 2, 7, But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Yet Enoch, because of his close walk with God, uh, he had the very mind of God. And listen, when you walk with God, you have that. You, he manifests Himself in your life. You'll have the mind of God, the purpose of God, the, the direction of God when you walk with God. And Enoch had that when there wasn't a church service that we know of, uh, when there wasn't an independent Baptist, fundamental Baptist church on the corner. Uh, there wasn't anything, in, anything that we know of like that. There wasn't the Word of God. And yet, he could see and preach what God was showing to him because he was walking with God. Now, let me say this. Notice what he knew in that time. Now, this is 3,000 years before Revelation chapter 19. But he saw God's plan of redemption fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, didn't he? You notice what he said? He said, I see the Lord doing what? Coming back with his saints. In other words, it's the very scene that John saw in chapter 19 in the book of Revelation 
uh, when God comes back, the second coming of the Lord. And John saw that, and we, we quote that, and we see that. He comes back on white horses uh, with the saints of God, and he has a new name written on his birth, uh, and his vesture deep in blood. And we all know that, but 3,000 years before John saw it, some 5,000 years ago, a man that walked with God saw the Lord returning to earth. Isn't that amazing? Amen. That's amazing. Yes. That he would see that. And he saw that. And so we see that the Bible is, is completely accurate. You can trust what the Word of God is telling us. And so judgment and wrath were on their way to this world because of great wickedness. Now, notice this. I believe that we're living in the book of Jude. Yeah. <clears throat> I believe that's where we're at right now. On the, God's prophetic calendar, if you read the book of Jude, I don't think it's any accident that it's placed there uh, right before the book of Revelation. Yeah. I don't believe that's any, and I don't believe it's any accident that it quotes Enoch. Okay, mm -hmm. it quotes Enoch and it talks about Enoch who was right there before the judgment was to come upon the world. Enoch was right there at the tip of this thing. I believe Jude is right there uh, before the, the Lord returns and before the tribulation starts. And I believe we're living in the book of Jude. Now that's significant because here's what it says. Matthew 24, 37, 39, our Lord speaking. He says, but as the days of Noah were. Yeah. That's, that's the days of Enoch. This is what he's saying. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So Enoch was seeing what Jesus is telling us right here. Okay? For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Think about that. Uh, the preacher of righteousness, which was Noah, was preaching uh, the Word of God that God had given him orally and through the Spirit of God, he was preaching that to a lost and dying world. Nobody was listening. They were having a great time. They were in their sin. They were partying. Uh, they were out. They were concerned with everything other than uh, God Himself. And He just kept preaching and preaching. But one day, just like that. Think about that. Noah got up. What's that? Uh-oh. Go get in the ark. Go get in the ark. And as a sudden, just like that. And it'll be like that again, just as in the days of Noah. Or don't be fooled because you look out here on the news, it looks like everybody's really living it up and having this great time and they're marrying and giving in marriage and going about their own business. But such as in the day of Noah. And what was going on in the day of Noah? The thought of every man yep. was wicked, just like we talked about this morning. And God looked down at and knew the thoughts, not just the deeds that we're doing, but He knew the thoughts of man, and He said, It repenteth me. It broke, in other words, when He uses that word repenteth, it's different than what He uses that in the New Testament. When we think of changing our mind, God doesn't change. He's not, there's no shadow of turning in Him. What that means is it broke God's heart when He saw what man was given over to, even in his thoughts. And in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Lord comes back. We are living in the days of Noah. We're living in the book of Jude. Enoch was right on the money. He looked down through the thousands of years, the eons of time, and said the Lord's going to come back and He's going to settle this thing and redeem His people. And he knew that. It's amazing. It's, I'm enjoying this. Amen. Enoch is a picture, I believe, and I believe if you most people, if you really study this, you'll see this. And Enoch is a picture of the church being spared from judgment. Yeah. He got translated. You know what you do when you translate something? Amen. Just like in when your translators translate a word, they take it out from one language and they put it into another language. Day. In other words, they took Enoch, went out of one world, and came into another world. Amen. That's what the rapture is. We're coming out of this world. We're going to be raptured up, snatched up. And Enoch was, and then bam, he was not. <laughs> and everybody said, we can't find Enoch. We can't find Enoch. Enoch was gone. Enoch was translated right before destruction was headed for this world. And it turned out to be just that. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. <clears throat> it was not found because God had translated him. Still going out in. That's a, it's the box. Alright. Notice what this is. The rapture. I told you he's a type of the rapture. <coughs> Noah. Uh, and if you're talking about eschatology, 
Noah's a type of a lot of things. He's a type, of course, the ark is a type of salvation. Uh, it's pitched within and out. Um, it's a lot of things going on there. But <clears throat> as far as prophetic, uh, if Enoch is a type of the church getting raptured out, Noah is a type of the Jewish people. God takes the Jewish people right on through the destruction and brings them out on the other side into a new earth, Amen. right, and a new heaven. Everything was changed after that. The old was passed away and everything became new. And so, uh, <clears throat> prophetically speaking, you see Noah and the Israelites who would one day be the Jews. There was no Jewish people at this point, but they would be. And he takes them right over through that tribulation, just like he's going to take them through the seven years of tribulation. And so you have Enoch, you have the rapture of the church, you have Noah, the, the, people that are, the Jewish people that are going to go uh, right through the tribulation and come out into a new heaven and a new earth just like Noah did. And so that's the prophetic future there that Enoch is important for you and I to understand. And so we see the future that he knew uh, way before even the New Testament was even in the mind of any man. And now not only do we see the future in Enoch, but we see Enoch and his family. Now we're going to get to some practical stuff. Enoch and his family. As I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> Enoch lived in a very wicked, wicked day, much like we're living in now. Right before God's judgment is going to be pronounced. And God saw that wickedness of man that was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. But did you know, when you think about this, despite your surroundings, you can walk with God. Yeah. Right. Hey. If Enoch can walk with God, in a time when God was broken hearted, so broken hearted that he told Enoch, he said, look, I'm going to destroy everything. I don't believe Noah was the first one to know about destruction. And I'll show you that in a minute in the Bible. But I believe Enoch knew that something was coming from God that wasn't good. And yet, the Bible says that Enoch walked with God even after he knew the bad was coming. Not only did he walk with God, uh, but he raised a family. Uh, and he, he raised children in this wicked and perverse generation. When you walk with God, you fulfill the very desire of God. Your circumstance around you and the time you were born is the time that God put you here. Okay, He put you here at this time, at this place, for a reason. And His desire for you above all things is to fellowship with you, to, uh, to walk, you to walk with Him. And you can do that through His Son, Jesus Christ. Now listen to what Micah 6, 8 says. He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly, walk humbly with thy God. And that's something. God said, here's what I, here's what I really enjoy. I enjoy you walking with me. Now you think about the significance of that. The God of the universe made you and enjoys your company. Yeah. Think about that. There's no presidents or kings calling me to chat Monday mornings on the phone. They're not inviting me over to their family dinners to chat with me. Now they don't want my company. They don't want a fellowship with me. But the God of the universe made me so that He could knock on the door of my heart. Amen. And that I'd open it up and that He would come in and sup with me and fellowship with me and we could just talk back and forth. And when I'm hurting and down, He'd come put His arms around me and say, everything's going to be all right uh, because I'm here now. And when I cry out to heaven and He comes down in my situation, He comes down and says, everything's going to be all right now because I'm here. Daddy's here. The Father's here. Making everything better. And He desires that. He desires... To fellowship with me more than I desire to fellowship with Him. Think about that. It's amazing. And Enoch knew the secret of that. He had a testimony that he pleased God. He pleased God by what? By what? Walking with Him. Just by walking with Him. Fellowshipping with Him. Having faith in Him. That verse I just read to you, verse 5, it says... Uh, that he was translated, he was not. And, and before before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. The next verse says, but without faith it is impossible to please God. How's your faith? How's your faith? It says without it you can't please Him. I told you this morning, faith is obedience despite all your circumstances around you. Faith is really, it's agreeing with God despite everything your mind is telling you. You ever think that can't happen? 
Your mind just play tricks on them. You see somebody, some gutter, uh, somebody in the gutter most, and you say there's no help for them. Your mind tells you that, doesn't it? Uh, you look at your situation around and say, hmm, God can't help me in this deal. But I want to tell you, you have to have faith to please God. And Amos said, can two walk together except they be agreed? In other words, do you agree with what your mind tells you, what Oprah tells you, what your buddies on Facebook tell you, or do you agree with what God says? Because you can't walk with God unless you agree with Him by faith. I'm wrong on whatever I think, God, but you're right on everything that you think, and I agree with you. And so the first thing is faith. Uh, that's what pleases God. That's what enables us to walk with God because we're agreeing. It's interesting. When you look at the ages of the genealogies and you study chapter 5 of the, these antediluvians that you'll hear them called or, or the people before the flood, uh, that's what they're called, that Adam was alive for the whole time that Enoch was alive. They were contemporary. I mean, in other words, his grandpa was Adam. Okay? His grandpa was Adam. Adam lived at 900 some years old. Uh, Enoch, uh, he would have... Uh, would have been born about 600, about out of 600 a year if you go by these genealogies. And so, can you imagine that you would live in a time when you could talk to your grandpa Adam who walked with God? Think about that. I wonder how that conversation went, brother. Mike. Grandpa, can you tell me how it was? Oh, you know. I remember very well how the, in the cool of the day God used to come down. He'd say, Adam, and he'd say, Adam, where are you at? Where's you? He, he would talk to your grandma and I. He'd say, where are you at? He'd come and he'd fellowship with us. And we'd, have, and we'd walk and talk and, 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 and he would love on us. And, and uh, you just don't know how that was, Enoch. It was so wonderful. He, he says, Enoch, you know what it was like? It was like, it was like paradise. It was just like paradise. Enoch sitting at the feet of Old Adam hearing those stories. I believe he heard about that and said, you know, that, that sounds good. That's what I want. And he had a heart for God. He had a heart to walk with God. And he said, I want, I want that, Grandpa. I want what you had over there. That must have been great, Grandpa. Right? Can you see the little tears welling up in old Adam's eyes as he's telling that story? How it was so good. Why don't you walk like that anymore with God, Grandpa? Why don't you walk like that anymore with Him? Well, you know, <laughs> it's a bad thing. Sin broke the fellowship. So that's what sin does. It keeps you from walking with God. It keeps you from fellowshipping with Him. But you'll notice what happened. Do you notice that verse? Let me read this again. I know I'm rambling on. Listen. And Enoch, Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he got, begat Methuselah 300 years. I believe when you have children, it's a good time to get right with God. Isn't it? Amen. Something happened after he had that first baby boy. I believe he looked down at Methuselah and God told him. So you know what Methuselah, the name Methuselah means? Dr. Adrian Rogers, among a lot of preachers and scholars, the name Methuselah uh, means that when he is dead, God will show. That's interesting, isn't it? When he is dead, God will show. Or when he is dead, God will sin. Dr. Henry Morrison translates that the same way in his book, the Genesis record, Methuselah, the two Hebrew words, and it means exactly what Dr. Morris, I believe, translated. When he is dead, it shall be shown, or it shall be sent. You know what happened after Methuselah died? It was judgment. It was judgment. God held off his hand until Methuselah died to bring judgment on this world. Now the reason that's important is Methuselah was the oldest man that's ever recorded that lived, right? And Methuselah lived longer than anybody else lived, and I believe this because of God's mercy. Amen. Hey. Yeah. 
God said, Enoch, I got some bad news. You've had your first son. You're excited as you can be. You're, you're, you're going to have a, a great family, but you live in a wicked town. And I'm telling you, I'm coming to judge this world. Yeah. He said, I think I'll name my son Methuselah to remind me of that. God forbid. You know what? One of the most, and you know this as a parent, <coughs> one thing you don't want to do is there be a stumbling block to your children. Right. Amen. You know, there won't be a stumbling block that will turn them away from the Lord. That's right. And I believe Methuselah was setting his mind right then. He said, look, I'm going to be a father, and I've got a heavenly father, and I'm going to point all my family with everything that I have, I'm going to point them towards God. And, and Enoch raised a, a son, Methuselah, who was a godly man. He raised another godly man named Lamech, another Lamech uh, named Lamech, and Lamech raised a uh, godly son named what? Noah. No. Named Noah. You know, the, the heritage you leave in your family, it keeps going on, doesn't it? Uh, how, the way you raise your family, the way you keep your family, what, the way you conduct your business carries on generation from generation. I believe that. You make a difference in the time that you're living. You can have a godly family in a wicked time. You can. You can have godly children. You can have godly family. You can be a godly man, a woman, boy, a girl. Despite the circumstances that are around you, despite what everybody's saying, what everybody is, is doing, uh, you don't have to go along with the crowd. You can be like Enoch and walk with God in a wicked, wicked time. You can raise a family in a wicked, wicked time. And you can be the kind of person uh, that has faith enough to fellowship and walk and please God in a wicked time. You can. And notice next, Enoch and his faithfulness. Now, I harp on this all the time. We've got a generation uh, now in church and Christianity where faith is separated from faithfulness. You know what I mean? Everybody talks about their faith but they don't show it in their faithfulness. Right. In other words, when you look in the Bible, there was never a difference between faith and faithfulness. People that had faith, it would just assume that you was faithful. If you look at the New Testament church, that's how it was. You look at the faithful men, they put some feet to their faith. And I want you to leave you with this point. I saved when I was 22 years old. And so now I'm 49. I've had a walk with God. God permits, I'll have another day of walk, maybe another two days, maybe 10 years, maybe 20, 30 years, but just a small time, really. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've been discouraged already, just a few decades, or just a couple decades. There. Just discouraged, my walk wasn't what it needed to be, I, was, I just hit some valleys. Anybody ever walked through some valleys? Yeah. Amen. Well, I made some valleys of my own making. Anybody ever? You don't have to raise your hand for that. Made my own valleys of my own making. Had some mountain tops. Had some bad times. Powdered a little bit about the whole thing. You know how your kids when they stick their lip out? I can still do that. <laughs> <In my age. laughs> Ain't that right, baby? <laughs> I got to pipe to somebody. My own walk's been this and that. And I've tried to walk with the Lord. And I know many of you have. In this just a short little bit of time. But he not walked with God 300 years. I feel bad complaining about my wife. This Lord, what's my, what? Can you imagine what he saw in 300 years? I mean, we struggled with just a few decades walking with God. And then we gripe and moan and complain about this and that. And here's a man that walked with God for 300 years. He begot, no telling how many kids. Said he begot sons and daughters. Back then, you know, they'd have 100 or 200. It wasn't no big deal back then. They're like Jeremiah. They're going to go on a dozen, maybe. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> so the man knew something about family, didn't he? I mean, he knew something about family. He knew something about, ain't you tell how much family he had? You know, he knew something uh, about life. And for 300 years, he just kept walking. Can you imagine the valleys that you could walk to in 300 years? I mean, just think of all the trouble you've had. Uh, just in this short life that we live now. But for 300 years, he just kept walking and being faithful. He just walked with God. He just walked with God. And one day, he's walking with God. He says, God, why don't you come on home? This Enoch's got a fine meal. 
all cooked. We'll go home and fellowship in my house. God said, well, tell you what, ain't not, we're a little closer to my home than we are yours. Why don't you just come home with me? Hey. God took him. And you know, they looked for him. You know, the Bible over read it said they looked for him. They searched for him. They couldn't find him. They said, we're going to go over here to where Enoch hangs. I don't know where they search for me if I got gone. Some people, if they get gone, first place to search for them is a the club, man. Mm -hmm. You see that on TV all the time. Well, last scene coming out of the club, two o'clock morning, <laughs> missing person. <laughs> Looking all over for them, can't find them. Last time they were seen, they were seen with this person. Be on the lookout. They looked all over for old Enoch. They said, well, he usually over here praying in the mornings. They probably run over there, seeing where his knees had been. Can't find him there. He's usually over here at this altar he's made. A lot of times he'll come over here to sacrifice. Make sacrifices to God. Let's look over there and see if we can find him. They looked over there and they couldn't find him. They found him not because God had took him. Are you walking with God? I mean, do you know the mind of Christ? Are you walking so close to Him that you just know every step and feel His presence? You've got direction. You've got uh, wisdom because you're walking with Him. Your future is secure. Just like what Enoch knew was coming. Yeah. He didn't just throw up the towel and say, you know what? Hopeless. It's all fatal. Vanity of vanity. Just let the kids do what they want to do. It's all destruction anyway. Now he just kept being faithful. Knowing what was coming. How about your family? <coughs> Does your family know where you stand? Are you raising and putting godly influence in your house and in your home and in your small little ones, grandkids, nephews? How about your faithfulness? I wonder if you got to miss them. Would anybody come to the church to look for you? Would anybody uh, look for you over in your prayer, prayer closet? I think you might have fell asleep in your prayer closet and I can't find some door shut. Enoch walked with God. I wonder if we stand and we'll sing a verse or two. Maybe you just want to say, God. I want you to help me walk more faithful. I want to agree more with you. How can two walk together unless they agree? I, I want to get my mind right on some things. Just walk closer with you. I need a closer walk with thee. Lord, help me to do that. Help me to be more faithful. And go ahead and start playing. What have we got? 187. 187. Amazing grace. I'm going to sing a couple verses. You come. Whatever you need, you can see me. You come. You need a closer walk with Him. That's how you can do it.